Springfield, Bloomington, and Champaign churches. We are going to start singing a song. We're going to sing Friend of God. It is awesome to be together. to the Springfield area. Uh, my name is Josh, this is Michelle, and we lead the Springfield Church of Christ. It is so 
good to be in Springfield together this morning. Thank you so much to our brothers and sisters from Bloomington and Champaign for coming to visit us. Um, we just love the fellowship of the Prairieland churches. It is so special. And we are so excited to be hosting the second annual Tri-City service here. It has been a great last year. Of course, last year at this time, we had our big Tri-City service. And in February, we cherished time together with our uh, marriage retreat in Bloomington. That was great. And in March, we had a big uh, Tri-City campus uh, devotional, and we had 50 students uh, there with us celebrating in Springfield. It was so exciting. We're so immensely grateful for all of you and our partnership in the gospel. In Philippians 1, 3 through 6, it says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. I've got to share with you a story of inspiration really quickly. Uh, we had our first baptism in Springfield in the last year and a half. It's great how the Lord works. In March, we invited students from around the Midwest to come and spend their spring break in Springfield for Campus Connect. And so those students shared their faith all week. They encouraged the church, and they met a young man named Devin. Uh, later in the summer, we had some campus interns come and spend the summer with us. Uh, one of them is here, Gavin McNaughton. And these interns, they ran into Devin again, and they said, hey, we saw you in March. Hey, you really ought to study the Bible. And he said, yes. And then uh, this semester, I've studied, I studied the Bible with him uh, twice a week since the beginning of the semester. And during one of the studies, right there on campus, he said, you know what? I'm ready now. I want to get baptized now. And we went out to the Lincoln Land Community College pond, and we baptized him right there. So Devin's got some family plans that were months in the making, so he, he's not here with us this morning, but we look forward to having him in the Springfield Fellowship uh, from now on. I want to just pray for our service, and then we will continue powerfully in worship. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for the ways that you bless us and take care of us. We know that uh, every good thing does come from you, and we celebrate today knowing that this is a good thing. Our fellowship is a good thing. For us to come together and spend this time to worship you is a good thing. You are worthy of honor and glory and praise, and we lift your name on high this morning. God, I pray that through every part of our fellowship, you would be with us, that we would feel the moving of the Spirit, and that we would conform ourselves to the image that you've created and designed for us to be. God, we love you. And I pray that you're with us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship. Come on, Anna.
great God before um, our brother Nick comes up and leads the sermon for us. We're going to sing about our great God who is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper. He is a light in the darkness no matter what you're going through this week. Pray this over yourself. Let's pray this to God. Good morning. Great to have some echo. Uh, it's great to be here. I really appreciate uh, what uh, Lutz has had to share, the song uh, that we've sung. Waymaker is one of my current favorites, so I appreciate that that was on the list, even though I didn't know it was going to be there. 
Um, do I need to do anything about the echo here? I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to turn one of these off. How about that? Is that going to help? Is it still on now? Okay, we'll just see what happens. All right, so um, let's uh, say a prayer before we get into God's Word. God, we thank you for our time to be together, for the fellowship, for the friendships, for the, the camaraderie we have in, in central Illinois. And uh, we pray, God, that uh, you will make a way for more and more souls to be found, to be brought into your great light. Uh, we are so blessed. Those of us who know you, who call you Father, we are your sons and daughters. We are so blessed. And uh, we want to share your great news with the people around us. Uh, let us be a light that shines in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to look at some things from a different lens here this morning. Uh, you see a picture there of a person looking through a lens, maybe. I can't see what's in front of me. Okay, all right. So, uh, so we want to look at, uh, we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount from a little bit of a different lens, maybe, than in some ways that you've heard it uh, talked about. Uh, adults and kids see things from different lenses, like this next picture. You know, uh, we see a box and a kid sees a, a fighter plane, right? Uh, or this next picture, we see a bed and a kid sees what? Trampoline. Now, some of you adults still see a bed as a trampoline, and uh, that causes problems, but we won't get into that. Uh, and then some, uh, some little boys, when they know there's cooties, they see this. Uh, you know, uh, so, you know, adults see one thing and kids see something different. Uh, but let's move on. The title of the message here is Time to Shine. There's, that's the only thought, I'm, one thought to walk away with, it's time to shine. Okay, but before we get to that part of the Sermon on the Mount... Let's talk about some context, okay? So the next uh, slide there, Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus shows up and he starts his ministry and he's talking about a new king in a new kingdom. And it, this, is good, this is good news. And the people of that day, they understood this idea of proclamations of new kingdoms. When the kingdom of Greece came, they proclaimed, here's the kingdom of Greece, we're, we're something. And then when Rome took over, they said, hey, here's the kingdom of Rome, and we're something. And then when Jesus came along and he proclaimed the good news, he's saying, here's another new kingdom. But his kingdom was different than all the kingdoms of men. This was the kingdom of God. And so he was fired up. He started his ministry and he's saying something kind of pivotal there is repent. The next slide there. Repent. To, to see the kingdom of God. To be in the kingdom of God. It's going to take a change. It's going to take a change in how we think. It's going to change, it's going to change how we act. How we love. How we speak. How we church. Okay? It's going to be... Something's going to be different. Because this kingdom has come. And it's not just a kingdom for some people. It's a kingdom for all people. And so this is this new kingdom Jesus is talking about in, in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. And the verse will be up there here in a minute. Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and the people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Jesus did something that was unprecedented. He came on the scene, he's teaching, he's telling them about this new kingdom, and then he's doing something that had to blow their mind. All this list of people that, get, that got brought before him and Jesus healing them all. And I'm thinking, what would that look like today? And I think what it would look like is Jesus shows up at the hospital, at the most prominent hospital in our city. He walks through it and he just, everybody goes home. When, it, when he leaves the hospital, there's nobody left. He healed them all. That'd make the news. 
So news is spread all over Syria. And it's interesting, the last set of these verses, look who's large crowds from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea. What makes up this large crowd? It's not one people group. This is a crowd of, of various kinds of people. You've got religious people. You've got religious corrupt people. You've got religious people that don't like each other. You've got pagans from the Decapolis. So you've got a bunch of people groups who have to be looking around at, what are we all doing here? Because we don't usually get along. And this is the scene at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. This is context. Let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 5. Or let's finish. Oh, we just finished it off. Let's go to 5.1. So the good news is it's all people. Everybody, clean, unclean, Jew, Gentile, everybody. The, the, God's sending this message out to everybody. And we're glad about that, right? I'm glad it includes everybody. It includes somebody like me. It includes somebody that's sitting next to you and you. In Matthew 5 and verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. He sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. The disciples have to be looking around and wondering what in the world is happening. What is Jesus doing? Look at this crowd. I'm a little confused, Jesus. I mean, I get healing a bunch of people. And, and not being discriminatory about who you heal, but surely you're not here to teach all... I mean, look at that guy. He's from the Decapolis. I mean, no way, right? Yeah, not him. Not him. Yeah. Look at this corrupt priest. I mean, surely you came to rain some fire down over here. It's, they got to be confused about what in the world this, this group, this crowd, this doesn't make sense. And then Jesus says, let me, let, let's, let, let's talk a little bit here. Let me paint a picture. I came to talk about a new kingdom. I came to bring in the kingdom of God. Let's paint a picture of what I'm talking about. And that's where we get into Matthew 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who will mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know how many times you've heard these verses, or how many times you've tried to wrap your mind around what... What exactly is all this saying? It takes a little bit of effort, at least for me. Because some of the things in this list I aspire to. But some of the things in this list I don't aspire to. But it's all worded the same. So, okay, um, let's see. I aspire to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Put me on that list. I aspire to show mercy so I get mercy. Put me on that list. Do you, I don't aspire to mourn. Don't put me on that list. You guys with me? That, how do you understand all these verses that are worded the same and yet I want some of them, but I don't want some of the other ones. So what's the picture? What is it that God's trying to paint? You know, then you got the word blessed. So I'm, I'm blessed. Does that mean like I should be happy when I mourn? Well, I'm not, so maybe that's not a good, a, a good interpretation. Should I aspire to? Well, that doesn't really work either. We've already gone over that one. You know, another way of looking at it is, and this might be a new lens, is God is for you when. God is for you when you mourn. God is on your side when you're poor in spirit. God is for you when you hunger and thirst for life. God is for you in these situations. And you think about, well, who are, these, who are the people that are in mourning? Who are the people that are poor in spirit? A lot of times, they're the people that are on a fringe. They're on the outside. They're having hard days. Sometimes when, when we look at ourselves, we can think, where's God on the hard days? And God says, I'm for you then. God is for the outsider. And I'm glad. 
because a lot of times I feel like an outsider. You know, Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. He's a Jew writing to primarily a Jewish audience. That's why Matthew 1 has the genealogy, because a Jewish audience would care about the genealogy. Okay, so he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and Matthew was an outsider. He was a tax collector. He was hated by his own people. He would have been viewed as somebody that turned his back on his, on his religion, if you will. He's extorting God's people. Matthew's the kind of guy that he needed a second chance. He needed mercy. Who's going to show Matthew mercy? Who's going to have it? What, what, what kingdom includes a Matthew? What kingdom includes those who mourn? What kingdom includes those who are poor in spirit? When you're going to build up a kingdom of men, you pick the best. People that they're not mourning, they're not poor in spirit, they got a great resume. That's who you pick. And Jesus said, I've come to bring the kingdom of God, and I choose the outsiders. I choose those who are not. I choose the unclean, and I give them a chance. I choose those who have failed, and I say, you get a second chance. He's painting a picture of the kingdom of God. And one of the key pieces of this kingdom is mercy. Mercy. Mercy is powerful. Mercy is difficult. Mercy is a God-sized idea. You think about the last fight you had with your friend, or if you're married, the last time you had a spat, a spat with your your spouse, probably on the way to church today, and you're sitting and you know you got a little a chair of separation between you. Um, I don't know how I'd like a dollar for every time any of us came to church and, and we were in a rift with our spouse. We, we could like fund a whole you know campus minister. Um, we need mercy, God-sized mercy, and God came to bring a kingdom that has mercy for all people. And it's a concept that was difficult for his guys to wrap their minds around. They looked at the crowd, and I'm sure in their mind, they had ideas of, I, I, know, I know this pe people group, the Decapolis. Yeah, I know how to handle them. I know how to look at them. Those are the pagans. That, that's who they are. That's that people group. I got them labeled and figured out. Here's the Sadducees. Yeah, yeah, they're the priests of God, but they're corrupt. I got them figured out. I got them labeled. It's easy to do that. Jesus shows up and says, I got mercy for all those people. Let's take those labels off. Let's give them a second chance. Let's see who they can be. And they got to, Jesus does something very interesting from verse 10 to 11. In verse 10, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted. Verse 11, he says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. So he goes from those, general, those people, they, you know, it's like, who said, oh, they did. He goes from those and the general to you. Blessed are you. He took his guys and said, now let's stop talking in theory, and let's bring it home. How are you feeling? What are you thinking? Where are you landing? How do you feel about me liking all these people? How are you feeling about being persecuted for showing mercy to those people that you've labeled and you don't like? And he makes it personal. Because in God's kingdom, this new kingdom, this kingdom of God, it's not about generalizations. It's not about philosophy. It's about repentance. It's about a heart changing. He came to bring a revolution of the heart. How we see other people. Even how we see ourselves. We need to extend ourselves mercy a lot of times. And sometimes that's the hardest place. We look in the mirror, we, got, we can have mercy for, for Tracy because he's a knucklehead. But I look in the mirror and I got no mercy for me. That could be a, a, the first place we got to start. Let's make, it, let's make it personal. It is personal. Jesus came and died on the cross because it was personal to extend mercy to all people. And then finally we get to the verse, the one verse, the takeaway from today, time to shine, Matthew chapter 5, 
13 through 16. Let's, let's wrap it up here. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So, number one, we're the salt of the earth. That's not the takeaway today, but it's the same concept. You know, if you've ever salted anything, you want to taste that it got that salt showed up there. You ever shake a shaker at a restaurant and then you eat your fry and it didn't it's not any saltier? And you're like, what's wrong with a salt shaker? You do it in your hand, I gotta see it coming out. I'm not getting anything. I don't know what happens to those salt shakers, but they get all jammed up. So you take the lid off, then you get plenty of salt. <laughs> We're the salt of the earth. In this new kingdom, we're, we're bringing a different lens, like Jesus brought a different lens. And then he goes on to say, similar to that, verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people take a light, uh, uh, light a lamp and put it under a bowl or put one under a Menards bucket. You're wondering, why is there an illuminated Menards bucket on the stage for crying out loud? Can someone get rid of that thing? It looks tacky. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't put a light under, the, under a bucket. You put it on here so it can make a difference. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In this new kingdom, with Jesus our new king, this kingdom of God, God says we, we, we're the light of the world. We're supposed to do good deeds, and when we do those good deeds, something miraculous happens. God is glorified. God is lifted up. God is put on center stage. I feel like post-COVID, it's time to shine. It's time for me to shine. It's time for you to shine. It's time for us to go do a bunch of good deeds and put God on display. We live in a new king with a new king and a new kingdom, and it means something. It's exciting to be part of God's kingdom. So I've got homework for you. The well, last slide there. I don't know if it's up there. What are two possible good deeds that you can do? This week, to shine for God. And I want us to make it practical. Let's make it personal. Let's think about it. Let's come up with, let's, let's think of two ways we can shine in addition to what we normally do. Okay. Two good deeds you can do before men, not so that we get a pat on the back, but so that God gets glorified. Amen. And so for some cross so from cross church fellowship, here's, a, here's something I'd like to put in front of us. When we have lunch, Meet somebody from another church, and, and I'm going to give you a, a, a fellowship question. Right. Say, hey, my name's Nick, and I was thinking about uh, the good deeds I could do this week, and you know what I thought of? There's this, there's this lady, and this is real, there's a lady, Shanna, who needs some help that I want to get another brother to go with me to help her. She's not part of the church, but she needs some help with her house. So that's, that's one of the things that I want to do this week. So, you go up to somebody over lunch. Hey, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm in the Bloomington Church. This is the good deed I thought of. Uh, what's your name? What did you think of? And we can have some cross-church fellowship over our take-home idea. You with me there? We live in a great kingdom of God. Let's do good deeds and bring Him glory. Amen. Amen. If you want to go ahead and stand. Let's take it back to the cross.
Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who do not know, my name's Kurt. This is Sunita. Hi. We uh, moved back to Illinois for me. This is our first time here, but back in June to lead the campus ministry at Illinois State. <laughs> so we're excited to be here uh, this morning with you all and to, to see some familiar faces, to meet a lot of new ones at, at lunch. But um, it is the time in our service where we get to reflect on Jesus. Uh, and specifically, I want to focus on the famous last words that he said on the cross. Uh, it's, you know, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and for those who are familiar with the story, it came after he was beaten, after he was flogged, he was betrayed, he was abandoned, and then he's on the cross, and it's this pivotal moment, right? And it says that he became sin on the cross. 
as our sins came into him. And God cannot be with sin. And so it's this, this just heartbreaking moment where we realize that our sins separated him from his father for the first time ever. But one thing that I recently learned um, is that that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was not made up on the cross. It was not something that Jesus came up with. Uh, it was actually referring to Psalm 22. You guys will be turning there if you have your Bibles. Uh, but in Psalm 22, it's, it's a Psalm of David, and it has 21 verses uh, where it's just his anguish as he pours out his heart in this really deep, dark spot in his life. Uh, and so we're going to read the first two uh, verses here. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And so we see David pouring out his heart. You know, we see him just wrestling with God and, and, and just as you read those 21 verses later, man, it is just obvious how much distress he's in. And it's easy to see why Jesus would relate to that, why he would, that would come to his mind as he's on the cross. It's like, man, that, that sentiment resonates. But this isn't actually a psalm of defeat. As you keep on reading uh, in verse 27, it says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nation. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down into the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And so Jesus is quoting a psalm of victory here. He's quoting that in his last breath that like this moment is my victory. You know, this moment is not what it looks like. It is so much bigger. And you can think about how out of place that would be if you're standing there, you know, and you're hurling insults and you're seeing this guy who had claims to be the son of God dying on the cross. And he quotes Psalm 22. You'd, it would make you wonder like what, how could that be anything but an embarrassment? You know, what is he talking about? He must be confused. But Jesus knew from the beginning that in his death was the salvation of the world. In his death, the power of sin was going to be stripped away. In his death, hope that could never perish, spoil, or fade would be cemented. And so broken and bloody and beaten, he was, he was standing triumphant. And now we can, sing, we can sing that same song. We can be bloody and bruised from the world but victorious in Jesus because he has done it. Amen. My wife is now going to share about how this uh, perspective impacts her. Hello. <laughs> um, so I really love the concept of victory and not defeat that Kurt spoke about. You know, obviously we know the story, right? Nick shared a little bit about it. Kurt shared about it. We read about it in the scriptures, right? The gospel of the cross. Jesus came. He died on the cross. We got forgiveness. We have a new life, right? We know all of this logically, but in the midst of the mess, confidence, you know, we lose our confidence and we lose our perspective of Jesus' victory, right? And it's lost through that. Personally, for me, I often find myself losing confidence in, in the hope that I know is true. When I'm beat down in life, but seeing Jesus' perspective, of declaring victory, even in the face of what the world considers or calls defeat, right? That gives me confidence. That gives me security when I'm faced with these defeats in the low points of my life. So no longer, I mean, I'm not going to be perfect. You know, we, <laughs> it's about the journey, right? But no longer am I going to give in to discouragement and accept a position of defeat. I'm going to declare victory before, during, and after challenges because he has done it. So even in the mess, we can all declare our victory, right, in Jesus. Remember our victory in Jesus as we take the communion today. So let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity and this time to meet together to reflect on Jesus and the hope that you've left us with. I pray that we take the position of victory and not accept defeat because we know, as you have shown time and time again, that the battle has already been won. Amen. 
God help us to have the same boldness and courage to declare your victory in every part of our lives. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for Kurt and Sunita and Nick for great, inspiring messages this morning. Uh, now is the time we're going to pass the plates for a contribution. And so, you had noticed, there's three different churches here. So the way this is going to work is uh, we're just going to pass the plate just for Springfield. If you want to give to your church in Bloomington or Champaign, give online. Um, yeah, now is the time we're going to come together and pray real quickly, and then we'll pass the plates. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you that uh, we live in a place like this where we can afford to give anything, God. We thank you that our money as we, as we give, and not just our money, our time and our energy and our efforts, God, that all these things, when we think about our life as a living sacrifice, that it's not temporary, Father, that we're investing in something eternal, that you're taking what little gifts we give and you're making it have eternal impact, Father. May this move our hearts to compassion. May this move our hearts to just want to give ourselves away, to give our lives away, to give our money away, God, for your purposes, Father. Keep worry from us, keep fear from us, uh, keep selfishness from us, and help us to see that what you've given us, you've given to us to be stewards of, God. Uh, and thank you for this time to give this morning. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. It has been an incredible day so far. Amen. I would say that our second annual yearly kickoff <laughs> has just kicked off in such a magnificent way. It, the singing, thank you for all of those who came early, who came yesterday to set up, to come in early this morning to get prepared to lead our hearts in worship. Thank you so much. It means so, it means so much to me because I've been serving in Kids Kingdom for the last year. This is like my sixth service in a year. So I'm like super excited. Um, but I, I just think also that, Nick, your lesson and our communion service just blend so well together. Oh, my goodness. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been a disciple, Man, that lesson today, what a joy, what a blessing to be a part of God's kingdom. What an incredible blessing to understand God's mercy. And I know that's something I'm constantly growing and understanding, and I probably just have a nail clip of understanding compared to God's wisdom, but man, am I thankful? Yes. Yes, because I get to walk in victory. I don't have to deal. I don't have to worry about discouragement. I don't have to worry about all my past sins or even all my future sins because you know what? They're forgiven. I get to walk in mercy. doesn't mean I'm going to go out and sin it up, but I'm, I'm, I'm a part of God's kingdom, and I'm very, very thankful for that. So I thank you to all that have come in early today that have led our hearts either through song or through teaching or through communion. It's been so good so far today. Amen. And we still have more to come. Now, yes. Nick gave us homework. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Go up to somebody you don't know from another church and say, Hi, my name is Nick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Call me a knucklehead from the stage, pal. <laughs> Actually, it was very prophetic. I want to apologize to everybody. I got everything here except the communion supplies, the most important thing. I forgot it. And about two minutes before service started, I went, oh, I forgot the communion. And Alec had to run out and get some, and we had to totally rearrange the whole service. Hopefully, you didn't even notice. Because we try not to be distracting. The singers noticed because they're going, this is not at all what we went over. <laughs> since 8 o'clock this morning, yeah. But we're going to have a song and wrap up here in just a second, and then the party moves outside, amen? Uh, now, uh, there's a grill going out there. If you brought uh, something to cook on the grill, you can take it to them. However, don't bring them a pound of meat and say, can you bring me four burgers out of this? No. Make your own burgers and bring them the burgers, and then say, cook these for me, if you will. That'll help those guys out a lot. Uh, there's going to be a bags tournament going there, and Nick and Kurt are kind of heading that up. You want to talk to them. If you got a partner, go sign up. If you don't have a partner, say, I want to play, but I don't have anybody yet. And so they'll hook you up with some other people, and you'll be able to have a good time. And it's all the mercy of God. They'll be blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are those who are triumphant. We don't know who's who yet. Amen. Uh, also, after this last song... You get to help out because what we want is everybody to help bring their chairs. Let's see, where is that room? Is that room over there, right? Bring your chairs over there. They're going to stack them up and, and, and you know, be able to put them up. This is going to help out people while we're outside eating aren't in here cleaning. And pick up those little communion cups and throw those away and just pick up whatever trash. We can do that after the last song. And then with something that's very encouraging, after the service... Uh, we're going to expand the kingdom of God with a baptism in Lake Springfield. Amen? <laughs> Matt Bailey from Champaign. He's right over here. Okay, yeah. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's a co-worker with Joe Fegis, and Matt and I have been studying for the past two or three months, and uh, he came down. I said, dude, man, why don't we just go down to the lake after service? And he said, absolutely. So... We're going to change clothes, and if you kind of see us heading down there and you want to come join us, that will be great, uh, and we will have a great time uh, celebrating uh, being born again in the kingdom of God, celebrating the kingdom of God, celebrating our fellowship. Amen? Yeah. Let's stand up and have the worship team come on back up stage. We're going to close out with the song, Here Am I, Send Me.
I was going to tell you guys to stand up, but he already said that. Uh, awesome. We're going to sing one more song, like you said, here in my son me. Um, let's think about the sermon as we're singing this song. You know, let's be a light, uh, especially in terms of just bringing people to God and uh, really bringing glory to him. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back.